How to Be a Doctor by Stephen Laycock Certainly the progress of science is a wonderful thing. One can't help feeling proud of it. I must admit I do. Whenever I get talking to anyone, that is, to anyone who knows even less about it than I do, about the marvelous development of electricity, for instance, I feel as if I had been personally responsible for it. As for the linotype and the aeroplane and the, and the vacuum house cleaner, well, I'm not sure that I didn't invent them myself. I believe all generous-hearted men feel just the same way about it. However, that is not the point I am intending to discuss. What I want to speak about is the progress of medicine. There, if you like, is something wonderful. Any lover of humanity, or of either sex of it, who looks back on the achievements of medical science must feel his heart glow and his right ventricle expand with the pericardiac stimulus of permissible pride. Just think of it. A hundred years ago, there were no bacilli, no tomain poisoning, no diphtheria, and no appendicitis. Rabies was but little known and only imperfectly developed. All of these we owe to medical science. Even such things as psoriasis and paratitis and trypanosomiasis, which are now household names, were only known to the few and were quite beyond the reach of the great mass of the people. Or consider the advance of the science on its practical side. A hundred years ago, it used to be supposed that fever could be cured by the letting of blood. Now we know positively that it cannot. Even 70 years ago, it was thought that fever was curable by the administration of sedative drugs. Now we know that it isn't. For the matter of that, as recently as 30 years ago, doctors thought that they could heal a fever by means of low diet and the application of ice. Now they are absolutely certain they cannot. This instance shows the steady progress made in the treatment of fever. But there has been the same cheering advance all along the line. Take rheumatism. A few generations ago, people with rheumatism used to have to carry around potatoes in their pockets as a means of cure. Now the doctors allow them to carry absolutely anything they like. They may go around with their pockets full of watermelons if they wish to. It makes no difference. Or take the treatment of epilepsy. It used to be supposed that the first thing to do in sudden attacks of this kind was to unfasten the patient's collar and let him breathe. At present, on the contrary, many doctors consider it better to button up the patient's collar and let him choke. In only one respect has there been a decided lack of progress in the domain of medicine, that is, in the time it takes to become a qualified practitioner. In the good old days, a man was turned out thoroughly equipped. After putting in two winter sessions at a college, and spending his summers in running logs for a sawmill. Some of the students were turned out even sooner. Nowadays, it takes anywhere from five to eight years to become a doctor. Of course, one is willing to grant that our young men are growing stupider and lazier every year. This fact will be corroborated at once by any man over fifty years of age, but even when this is said, it seems odd that a man should study eight years now to learn what he used to acquire. In eight months. However, let that go. The point I want to develop is that the modern doctor's business is an extremely simple one, which could be acquired in about two weeks. This is the way it's done. The patient enters the consulting room. Doctor, he says, I have a bad pain. Where is it? Here. Stand up, says the doctor. Put your arms above your head. Then the doctor goes behind the patient and strikes him a powerful blow in the back. Do you feel that, he says. I do, says the patient. Then the doctor turns suddenly and lets him have a left hook under the heart. Can you feel that, he says viciously, as the patient falls over on the sofa in a heap. Get up, says the doctor, and counts to ten. The patient rises. The doctor looks him over very carefully without speaking, and then suddenly fetches him a blow in the stomach that doubles him up, speechless. The doctor walks over to the window and reads the morning paper for a while. 
Presently he turns and begins to mutter more to himself than the patient. Hmm, he says. There's a slight anesthesia of the tympanum. Is that so? says the patient in an agony of fear. What can I do about it, doctor? Well, says the doctor, I want you to keep very quiet. You'll have to go to bed and stay there and keep quiet. In reality, of course, the doctor hasn't the least idea what is wrong with the man, but he does know that if he will go to bed and keep quiet, awfully quiet, he'll either get quietly well again, or else die a quiet death. Meantime, if the doctor calls every morning and thumps and beats him, he can keep the patient submissive and perhaps force him to confess what's wrong with him. What about diet, doctor? says the patient, completely cowed. The answer to this question varies very much. Depends on how the doctor's feeling and whether it's long since he had a meal himself. If it's late in the morning and the doctor is ravenously hungry, he says, Oh, eat plenty, don't be afraid of it. Eat meat, vegetables, starch, glue, cement, anything you like. But if the doctor has just had lunch, and if his breathing is short-circuited with huckleberry pie, he says very firmly, No, I don't want you to eat anything at all. Absolutely not a bite. Won't hurt you. A little self-denial in the matter of eating is the best thing in the world. And what about drinking? Again, the doctor's answer varies. He may say, oh, yes, you might drink a glass of lager now and then, or if you prefer it, a gin and soda, or whiskey and apollinaris, and I think before going to bed I'd take a hot scotch with a couple of lumps of white sugar and a bit of lemon peel in it, and a good grating of nutmeg on the top. The doctor says this with real feeling, and his eye glistens with the pure love of his profession. But if, on the other hand, the doctor has spent the night before at a little gathering of medical friends, he is very apt to forbid the patient to touch alcohol in any shape, and to dismiss the subject with great severity. Of course, this treatment in and of itself would appear too transparent and would fail to inspire the patient with proper confidence, but nowadays this element is supplied by the work of the analytical laboratory. Whatever is wrong with the patient... The doctor insists on snipping off parts and pieces and extracts of him and sending them mysteriously away to be analyzed. He cuts off a lock of the patient hair, marks it Mr. Smith's hair, October 1910. Then he clips off the lower part of the ear, wraps it in paper, and labels it part of Mr. Smith's ear, October 1910. Then he looks the patient up and down, with the scissors in his hand, and if he sees any likely part of him, he clips it off and wraps it up. Now this, oddly enough, is the very thing that fills the patient up with that sense of personal importance which is worth paying for. Yes, says the bandaged patient, later in the day to a group of friends much impressed. The doctor thinks there may be a slight anesthesia of the prognosis, but he sent my ear to New York and my appendix to Baltimore and a lock of my hair to the editors of all the medical journals. And meantime, I am to keep very quiet and not exert myself beyond drinking a hot scotch with lemon and nutmeg every half hour. With that, he sinks back faintly on his cushions, luxuriously happy. And yet, isn't that funny? You and I, and the rest of us, even if we know all this, as soon as we have a pain within us, rush for a doctor as fast as a hat can take us. Yes, personally, I even prefer an ambulance with a bell on it. It's more soothing.